church so much for being here. I'd invite you to make your way uh, in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, the last few weeks we spent time going through the seven churches found there in the book of Revelation. Uh, when next couple Sundays I'll be out uh, of pocket here, and when we get back, we'll probably start another series, um, still praying through what to, to look at on that, but I got some pretty good ideas. Uh, may preach another sermon or two out of the book of Revelation just uh, uh, to capture the judgment that is to come, but also the victory that is to be had. Um, when you look at this book, uh, Revelation, you have to be real careful. For my preaching style, I love to stay close to the trunk of the tree. I get real nervous when you get out on dreams and visions. When a writer is saying it was something like, what he's telling you is, I don't know what it was. I'm doing the best I can to describe it. So whenever a Bible or a, a, a someone who's a preacher is going to preach from somebody who recorded something they're unaware of, I, I'd say you better tread lightly before you come down real hard and say, thus saith the Lord, because you may not have it right, amen, because he's not sure he had it right. So this book here, as we go forward, John is going to be describing things that he's not seen before. I've titled today's message in tribute to my grandsons, uh, to infinity and beyond. Amen. Y'all heard a buzz light year? To infinity and beyond. The word infinity is, uh, we get from a Latin uh, word, it means without end. Uh, goes on, something that goes on forever or never comes to a stop. I want to remind you this morning that your soul, my soul, is going to go on forever. And it'll go on in one of two places. Either what the Bible refers to as hell or what the Bible refers to as heaven. And the only thing that can determine whether or not you go uh, to heaven is how you respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we've looked at these seven churches. My, what a mess some of them were in, amen? You, you know, some people rejoice in other people's mistakes. I'm not that kind of guy. But I want to tell you, whenever I read about these churches and the struggles they were going through, or I read about David or Solomon and realize they had problems too, it just kind of helps me understand that, hey, I, I don't have to be perfect in order to be saved. I'm made perfect by Jesus, but not by my own works. Here's what I'm, where I'm going with that. The church has never been perfect, and the church is not going to be perfect this side of heaven. A lot of people, when they get in church and they get around church people, and I've made it clear, church people aren't really a desirable crowd to be around. Christians are the ones that are desirable to be around. Amen? Church people put the Lord on the cross. When you get in church and you're excited about being saved, here's what, if you're not careful, you begin to think that everybody down at the local church loves the Lord and is seeking to serve Him. And you get involved and you get shot down and criticized uh, somewhere along the way. And if you're not careful, church can actually produce inside of each of us a spirit uh, of, of, of disillusionment or, or depression or anxiety. And man, when you go out through the Bible Belt in, in areas around here, you'll find some people that are down on the church. I just don't go to church, too many hypocrites. Well, there's a lot of hypocrites in church, yeah. 
But I always tell them you can either go to church with them or hell with them, which is it going to be? Church is short time. Hell's eternity. Amen? Don't ever think the preacher, the, the staff, the deacons, the teachers, the congregation is made up of perfect people who will never let you down or disappoint you. It's easy to get down on the church. But man, I want to tell you something this morning. I'm up on the church. I, I realize that, that things may not always be perfect in the life of the church, but whenever we get to thinking about the church, we, we got reason to be positive and up on the church. Now, just for clarity's sake, and you, you got church local, that's 265 Curry Highway, Farmstead Baptist Church, that's church local. You don't have to be saved to join here. You just have to tell us you are and get baptized, that's it. You can join any local church you want to join, no problem. But then there's the church universal. You don't join it. You're born into it. Church universal doesn't matter if you're a Nazarene, a Methodist, a Catholic, or a Baptist. If you're saved, you're part of the church universal. So I want to talk a little bit about the church universal and why I'm up on the church. And you're going to see that unpacked in verses 1 through 11 or the entire chapter uh, four of the book of Revelation. And I just want to tell you why we got good reason to be up on the church. Number one, the church, listen, the church universal is going to heaven. Look where John picks it up in verse one. After this, hang on to the after this. I'm going to come back to it after this when I get done reading the verse. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the, fir the, the first voice which I heard was as is it were of a trumpet talking with me. In other words, it was booming towards me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Oh, I'm not going to try to bore you with details, but there's a lot of details in this chapter. In the Greek, which I'm not an expert with, but you'd see that after this is the same word in the Greek as the word hereafter. So you, you've got the same word translated after this and hereafter. What does that matter, Brother Ernie? What it matters is they're tying all the verses together and it's referencing back to chapter 1 uh, and verse 19 where John, God, gives us the outline of what Revelation is about. John, I want you to write these things. What are the things that he writes? Well, he tells him the things thou hast seen. That's chapters one. That's chapter one. John saw Jesus Christ revealed. That's the revelation. That's the name of the book. What you see. Write the things which are, chapters 2 and 3, thus the church age, the seven churches of there in Asia, and what shall be future tense, that's chapter 4 and following. So we're now transitioning into chapters 4 and 5, which occur after the church age. And they show the saints there in heaven worshiping God. And then in chapter 6 to 19, we may touch on, uh, that occurs after the church age. And it shows this world suffering through the great tribulation. He said, the voice that spoke to me was like a trumpet, man. When you think about trumpet, and there's a lot of symbolism in this. And I, I'm telling you, if you're not careful, you get around some people uh, who have a real good imagination and they begin to make everything mean something in the Bible. And that scares me because I don't want to be that guy. But there is typology and there is symbolism and some of it's pretty easy to pick up. And anytime the Bible explains to us or interprets what it means, that's a good time to speak loudly, amen? 
Trumpets in the Bible were significant. They were blown to signify war. When we hear that trump of Jesus Christ that we're going to talk about in the moment with regards to the rapture, hey, he's coming to take the church out. And when it comes back, to establish a thousand year reign. I, I want you to know he's not going to be riding a donkey. Uh, he's not going to be subject uh, to the world, the power and dominion of this world, beloved Jesus Christ, uh, God in flesh, the third person of the Godhead, and when that horn blows, is coming to take back his creation. Trumpet was also blown to sound a new season. I believe it's significant. Some folks think church is going through the tribulation. Some think we're going halfway through it. I think we're delivered from it. I believe the trumpet's blown. You just moved past the church age. Trumpet's blown. Now he's in heaven. This is a new season. Church age is past. We're living in that age or that dispensation of grace. But there's coming a day when this season will be over. Trumpet was also used... Uh, uh, as a signal of breaking camp. Take down your tent, pack it up, we're moving on. When the rapture occurs, beloved, we're going to, this old tent, this body that I'm uh, trapped in right now is going to be folded up and left behind and I'm getting a new one. Amen, hallelujah. And then he says in verse 2, and immediately, I was in the Spirit. Now what does it mean he was in the Spirit? I don't think John knew. I sure don't know. But I guarantee you one thing he was fully aware of. I'm in heaven spiritually and my body's still on Patmos down there. John has miraculously been transported into heaven. And there he is. And God's showing him what's going to be after the church age. And there was a throne he spoke about. Now this throne is going to be described further. I, I hope you can understand the throne that God the Father is sitting on. Represents His sovereignty. Complete control. There will be another, this word for throne will be used again with regards to the 24 elders. But it ain't the same throne. Throne God's own is surrounded by the elders and other stuff. We'll talk about that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here's what I want you to see right there. Smack dab in the middle of everything is God the Father sitting on his throne. And then in verse 3, here's where we got to underline a word that should color the rest of our reading of this book. And he that sat was to look upon like. I am, John is saying, I am fixing to use symbolic language. Neither John nor you and I have the vocabulary to describe Almighty God and the scenes that are going to be in heaven. And I'm not against these TV folks, Jack Van Impey and other people that see helicopters and blimps and rockets and all this uh, in every verse of Revelation. But I want to tell you right now, John didn't know. Nobody else knows. It's just like this, and this is the best way I can put it to you, amen, in my simplistic mind. The one sitting on the throne, it was like looking at a jasper and a sardine stone. And that is how uh, John McLennan said it on the Bible thing. Sardine, not the one in the cans that you eat that's make your breath smell bad. Amen. The, the jasper was a very clear, bright stone. The, the sardine was a blood red stone, kind of like a ruby, I guess, is the way some. I don't know all the significance of that. A lot of people try to tie a lot of meaning into it. But here's what I do know. The jasper was the last stone on the high priest's breast uh, plate and the first stone of the foundation of the heavenly Jerusalem. The sardine was the first stone on the high priest's breastplate and the sixth stone of the foundation of the heavenly Jerusalem. That's all I really know and I don't know how else to say that. 
But looking at him was like looking through these magnificent stones, crystal clear, HD. Uh, I'm talking about just as red as red could be. But also he describes further that it was surrounded by a rainbow. And he uses the word emerald, meaning green. Man, when you try to imagine crystal clear HD with a red glow surrounded by a rainbow uh, that's giving off the color green, I don't know what all that means. I, I do know this on the rainbow. I'm pretty confident about what I read in the Bible about a rainbow. He didn't see a third or a half of a rainbow. He said the, the rainbow went all the way around. What does a rainbow signify in the Bible? The storm is over. Amen. You remember when Noah saw the rainbow? That, that was a deal God made with him. I'm not going to do this anymore. The storm's over. You can get ready to get off the boat. Let, let me say this to you, beloved. In this life, we are going to be faced with storms galore. I have no idea why it is that young babies may pass away. I don't understand why good people die and bad people live. And I don't understand why sometimes we got to go through this or that just to get here. I don't understand all that, but I do know one day all the storm's going to be over when we're in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm up on the church. I'm up on being saved because I know we're going to heaven, church. The world may not recognize God's authority, but let me tell you what, he still reigns nonetheless. People may not bow down to God today, but they're going to someday. The Bible says, wherefore God uh, also has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow uh, of things in heaven, earth, and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. Jesus is the only door to heaven. I, I told uh, <clears throat> Brother Drew, he's the new chairman of the Properties Committee, if y'all got any complaints. I want some shocks on these doors so they shut because they left open all the time the air runs. And I told him I wanted them so strong that when you let it go, if you don't hurry up and get out of the way, it's going to catch your heel and take your shoe off. Amen. I want them doors shut. Well, when the door of opportunity is shut, it's going to happen so quick you best be out of the way. You best be on the right side, but it's going to be over in a hurry. The symbolism of the rapture is all in verses 1 through 3. What's the rapture, Brother Ernie? Well, you know, I've read my Bible. I don't see the word rapture. I bet you ain't read the word Bible in your Bible either, but you still believe that's one. Amen. Come on now. Somebody say amen. <clears throat> Trinity. You believe in the Trinity. That ain't the Bible. It's just a word we use to describe something. When it comes to the rapture, that's a Latin word. Or it's a word that's Latin, translated from the Greek, harpazo. The word harpasso means caught up, to seize, to, to carry off by force. And it is the idea of rescuing from danger. When you think about the tribulation that is coming to this work, that's a time of great danger. And what the rapture is, is God snatching up Carrying off by force, just in the twinkling of an eye, uh, Paul said the church out of this world. In other words, God is going to rescue his children ahead of the danger that is to come to the earth. You remember Noah again? God got him out of the danger. You remember Lot? God got him out of the danger. I'm telling you, the church is going to be gotten out of the danger 
that is coming to this world through the tribulation period. At the rapture, the church is going to be taken out. You can read about that in 1 Thessalonians 4. At the rapture, not only is the church leaving, but the Spirit of God, the way He manifests to us today, is leaving. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7. And after the rapture, this world, those left behind, are going to face an unimaginable time of suffering on this earth. And you can read about that from chapter 6 on. And it's terrible. Hallelujah. The church is going to heaven. I'm up on the church. How about you this morning? I'm glad to be a church member. I'll tell you another reason. Be up on the church. It's because the church is going to be right there at the throne of God in heaven. I'm just going to read verse 4 on this. One. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. Now, I, you know, I don't know why they write it like that, but that's 24 seats. Amen. You just got to know that or either get you a different translation. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders, 24 elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. My word, my word. Let's think about that for a moment. A lot of symbolism here. I'm going to do the best I can with it. Of the things that I've read, studied, it appears to me that the, the best opinion I can give you is that the elders in the Old Testament, you had 12 tribes. In the New Testament, you had 12 apostles. So the elders, I think, represent... All the Old Testament saints who were saved by faith, just like we are in the coming Messiah. And then you also have in the New Testament represented all the saints that are saved by grace through faith, looking back uh, at the sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross. So right here in this verse, if I understand it right, all the elders, or the elders, the 24 elders, are representing the saints of all time. Beloved, all of us, whether it's uh, uh, Christians in Paul's day, or Abraham's day, or our day, we're all going to be surrounding the throne of God and setting there ruling and reigning with God. Not God, but with God. Man, we're going to be right there around the throne of God. Sitting signifies rest, amen? Right now today, we labor. We labor. We, 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 we labor for the kingdom. We labor for the Lord. The things that we, we do we do for Him, but there's coming a day when the labors are going to be over. We don't have to worry about upward or who's turning the lights on or singing or preaching today. We're just going to rest in the Lord, man. Don't have to worry about committee meetings, what the thermostats are set on, the music was too loud or not loud enough. Wow. Wow. Positionally, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.6, positionally we are already in heaven. But practically we're still on earth. At the rapture, we will practically be where God has already placed us positionally. We're not fighting to be, be better or get to heaven. If you're saved, you're already going. And you're already seated in the heavenlies, Paul said. Positionally, we are declared forgiven and justified. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, He such were some of you, but you, listen, you might have been that in old ways, but now you were washed 
but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Romans 5, 9, much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Beloved, whenever God saved you and I, He saved, forgave, and cleansed us forever and for all eternity. And we're never going to lose what He's done or undo what he has accomplished in his power through his blood. Positionally, we've already been declared righteous and justified, but practically, we anything but, amen? Positionally, I, I am declared by the, the word of God to be justified and righteous because of Christ and his work. But practically, I still got this sin nature that I struggle with. And at times, I guarantee you, I'm not what God says I am. Although he calls things that are not as though they are because he's looking at it from eternity perspective, not just the here and now. Man, this is a short term of endurance here. This is a short time of boot camp here in this world. And we're preparing for all of eternity. And then he says something about the crowns. When you read the crowns, talking about the crowns of gold, there are two words. You know how in the Greek you got different words for love? Well, there's two words used for crown. One has the diadem in mind. That's the many crowns that Jesus will wear when he returns. You and I got nothing to do with that. That's his. But then there's the crown, the Stephanos crown. That's the victor's crown given for those who win in certain competitions. Brother, sister in Christ, there are five crowns you and I have the opportunity to win in this life. One is the crown of life. Read about it in James 1.12, Revelation 2.10, the crown of life. That's the crown for those who faithfully, successfully endure the trials and the temptations that are here in this life. You'll receive that crown. Then there's the crown of righteousness spoken of in 2 Timothy 4.8. That is the crown that will be given to those who faithfully, earnestly live every day of their life expecting Christ to return. They're not bogged down or caught up uh, in the worldly things. No, beloved, their eyes and their focus uh, is on heaven. They'll receive the crown of righteousness. The crown of glory mentioned in 1 Peter 5, 4 for the faithful pastor. The crown of rejoicing. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The crown of rejoicing is for those who faithfully share the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then there's that imperishable crown. The crown for those who seek to live holy lives spoken of in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. These are the five crowns that you and I can earn here in this lifetime that God has made a big deal of pointing out that you and I should strive to earn. When we serve the Lord, I say this and we'll move on, move on to, the, to the last part of this. Listen. Our service to the Lord will not go unnoticed by the Lord. The preacher may miss it. The church may miss it. Others may miss it. But if you're serving the Lord out of a pure heart, God's got it and he's got it written down. Well, man, I sure wish somebody would have said something to him about this. Well, listen, I got news for you. One day they are. It may not be here in this life. But one day the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is going to say something to you about it. And even though you may go unnoticed, feel unappreciated while you're here on this life, I want you to know, be careful. Don't blow your rewards. Don't let them be done in the flesh because they're going to be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. No, you faithfully serve God regardless of what's going on around you because you know the Lord sees everything, knows every sacrifice you've made and every effort you've put forth and He knows the heart or the meaning. It might not have worked out the way you thought it would or hoped it would. Uh, you might look like a mistake, but the Lord knows the heart 
heart behind what you did. And one day Jesus will reward our faithful service to him. Man, can you see it? There we are snatched out of this life in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. There we are in heaven. And man, we're around the throne of God. This extremely bright HD thing. I don't know what it's going to look like. There's God the Father sitting right in the middle of it. And believers for all eternity. Charles Wesley and Moody and the rest of them all standing there together, man. And we're just going to be in the presence of God. The last thing and some of the most confusing verses, and I won't spend a ton of time on trying to share with you everything that other people imagine these verses to say, because I'm just not sure. But I tell you what I do see in these verses, and that's the fact that the church will be praising God for all eternity. Look at verse 5, he says, And out of the throne... Proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Well, I, I don't have to worry too much about getting that right because when you read Exodus 19, verse 16, the Bible says, and it came to pass, this is when Moses is up on the mountain, and the, it says, it came to pass on the third day in the morning there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. When he's talking about the voices and the thunders and the lightnings here, is speaking about the approaching judgment of God to befall the earth that we just left. And the sounds that were heard were uh, by the people over in Exodus or the people here are, are meant to be a warning that they'd better reverence God. The seven lamps mentioned in verse 5, Isaiah 11, 2 and 3 just point us to the fact that they represent the Holy Spirit of God in His fullness. Verse 6, And I beheld... And lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth to all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. I'm in, I'm in the wrong one, but man, that was getting so good, I didn't want to stop. I was sitting there thinking as I was reading, but I don't remember what I was supposed to say here. So let's get back where we were. <laughs> Over in chapter 4 and verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto a crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Man, I'm telling you, that's getting deep. Let's go on down to verse 9. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Man, I want to tell you, 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 you get to study in that passage using different people's opinion and you'll be all over the board. I want to give you this just as easily and quickly as I can. When you look at the wings and the eyes, uh, I, I believe that uh, it in some way ties to the attributes of God. He sees fully and completely and all the wings speak of His uh, uh, swiftness in judgment. And, and when it's referring to the beast like eagles and men and everything. I believe somebody's rightly said that all this, all those summed up, refer to all of creation. You remember in Genesis chapter 1 uh, when God took a whole bunch of nothing and created everything out of that nothing. He created the, the, the crawling things, the swimming 
seeing things. Uh, he gave us light and darkness. What I believe we see here is all of creation for all of time standing before God Almighty hollering, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty who was, He always has been, uh, who is right now and who always will be forevermore in eternity to come. All of creation standing there praising God. Now verse 10, the four and twenty elders, if my understanding is correct, representing all believers of all time, Old and New Testament, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat upon the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things. And for Thy pleasure, some of your translations would say, because you willed it, they were created. God is the one that willed this world into existence. Here's, here's where we're going to stop. Listen, the Bible says that they worshiped. They fell down and worshiped. There's a whole lot to be said about the word worship. Literally, it means to ascribe worth to. We worship with our mouth and with our deeds. We worship God when we talk about Him, sharing our testimony. We worship God when, when we sing about Him, we worship God when we preach or proclaim the gospel. We worship God with our mouth. But we also worship God with our life. When we surrender our life to Him, when we obey His Word, worship is through verbal and actions given to Him. They are bowing down, prostrating themselves. And what does the Bible say they're doing with those crowns? Why do we have crowns anyway? They're casting them at His feet. These crowns, by the way, are crowns that didn't get burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. Just a reminder, when the Lord gets this church out of here, all believers are going to what's referred to in the Bible as the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when we get to the judgment seat of Christ, just amen and hallelujah, there's going to be some crying, but I'm going to tell you something. It ain't because nobody's leaving there. If you made it to the judgment seat of Christ, it's because you're a child of God. You're not going to be unjustified or condemned to hell, but what He is going to do is break open the book of works. Well, God, I started this church. You know, I've done this and I've done that. Yeah, but you did it out of a spirit of selfishness or a spirit of, uh, of whatever it was. And therefore, it was not done for me because of me and by me and through my power. I'm going to strike a match to it and it's going to go up like wood, hay, and stubble. But those things that we did because we were led by God, motivated out of a true heart for God... Love, care for Him and other people. Those are the works that are going to stand, withstand the judgment. Those are the ones that we're going to receive these crowns. I didn't just not drink because I, I didn't want to be kicked out of my friend's circle. I didn't just not fornicate or, or lie or, or give in to this temptation or that temptation because uh, I wanted to please other people. God, I did it because I wanted to please you and be the best child of God that I could be for you. Those are the ones that are going on to heaven. And with those crowns, the Bible says that they're going to be putting them at His feet. Amen. They are worshiping Him because, listen, they realize, you and I will realize in heaven that there, listen, nothing we can do without God and apart from Him. When we're in heaven, we're going to see just what we really were before we got saved. When we're in heaven, I believe we're going to be able to see where we were headed before we got saved. When we're in heaven, I believe we're going to have a fuller, better, more complete understanding of just what God has done for us through salvation. And because of that, beloved, we're going to praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for all eternity. You know, when we get to heaven... 
We're not going to be floating on some thick cloud stroking a harp. <laughs> Amen? I've actually heard preachers say, you know, they're going to be hunting and fishing in heaven. Well, I'd like to know where you got that, like out of the second book of ignorance, I guess. But uh, I haven't read that in, in the Bible. I, I don't believe there's going to be no hunting and fishing. I don't know what heaven's going to be like, to be honest with you. But I'd be real careful about saying what the Bible doesn't say. We're not going to be up there riding four-wheelers. Much as I'd like to be. I sure don't want to be stuck in no desert area, you know, like what we see Jerusalem as now. But it wasn't like that back when God created it. All I know about heaven is that the child of God and the Savior we worship is going to be there. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions this morning. As we get ready to conclude our time together, are you excited about going to heaven, looking forward to seeing Him this morning? Are you excited about joining your voice with the voice of all saints throughout eternity where we can sing praises to the one who say? Are you excited about that? Are you excited about praising the one who sought you, bought you, delivered you from sin? My prayer is that I can live my life as an expression of praise to God here on this earth and in preparation for the praise that will take place in heaven. God is worthy of our love, devotion, our adoration, and our praise. Here's what I want to ask you this morning. Are you saved? If you're not saved, born again, child of God, I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about literally saved. Know Him personally. Then you're going to stand alone before Him in judgment. And you will have no chance. No good works are going to help you. You will have no chance of escaping the punishment that will be headed your way. If you're not saved this morning, I want to encourage you right now. Right now is a real good time to change that. You can come down here during this invitation. There's plenty of us in here who'd love to tell you what it means to know Jesus Christ personally. But I also want to say something about those of us who are saved. This altar is always open. You come down anytime during the service, during the week, I don't care. This is always open. Maybe some of us just need to hit our knees there at our seat, down front here, and just uh, ask God to forgive us for focusing on how bad it is here and ignoring how good He has been to us and the good He has planned for us. Maybe that's what you need to do today. Just hit your knees and give thanks. Give public thanks to God this morning. I don't really know or want to pretend to know what your need is this morning but I want to tell you something there is coming a day when no heartaches will come no more clouds in the sky no more tears to dim the eye all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore what a day glorious day that'll be I hope you're ready, prepared, and looking forward to that day. I would